The following program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. About money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. So it's Friday afternoon, and we're going to be talking about money. One of the things that has been controversial over the last year is the $15 minimum wage. And that's for Seattle. It's gaining traction in the rest of the country, in the rest of the state of Washington. The, the proposed wage by the president was $10.10. I want to address that whole issue and what's going on and what it really means. I want to give you my opinion, my take on what it means. That's coming later in the program. Later or beginning the program, I want to pick up where I left off last week. I started to get into financial planning and the methods of financial planning. I'm going to get and expand on that. That comes later in the program. You want to hear what my guest has to say? It's something you can salvage, something you can take home. Anyway, you'll, you'll appreciate that afterwards. So last week, I started the, the part on financial planning with a passage out of a book, a, a reading from a book, and I, I liked it so much, I thought I would do it again. Um, and it starts with a poem that I had to memorize when I was in school. Why I had to memorize it, I have no idea. Maybe it was because it was historical, presented actually when I was in middle school or where, whatever grade I was in at the time. It was presented as fact, even though it isn't. But anyway, it's a poem that you may be familiar with, too. It's by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and it begins, Listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive that, who remembers that famous day of year of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And the book goes on to say, Imagine for a moment it's 1923. Al Capone is assembling an army of gun-toting henchmen in Chicago. They will number 700 before he is through. Cotton farmers in the South are sunk in the Depression. The Ku Klux Klan is on the rise. Newspaper headlines tell of corruption in the Veterans Bureau. The, the head of the vet, Veterans Bureau had to resign, almost like today, almost like a couple months ago. Rumors in the Capitol hint of coming Teapot Dome scandal, and eventually two secretaries in the cabinet will go to jail convicted of corruption. But these are not the things that concern the President of the United States. What worries Warren Hardin, Harding, touring the country on a campaign swing, a campaign swing that will prove to be his last, is a recent attack on the legend of Paul Revere. An iconoclast had noted that Revere never completed the ride made famous by Longfellow. Before giving warning to Concord, Revere was discovered by the British and captured. Harding, however, Harding, however, told the crowd he didn't care. <clears throat> what Harding had to say was, I love the story of Paul Revere, whether he rode or not. You know, we may be scandalized today that Harding, in 1923, was so focused on Paul Revere when all the rest of that was going on. But the fact is, we may be less cynical than we think we are. The evidence suggests that we're just as susceptible to mythology as Americans in the past. The danger isn't that we have myths. The danger is hiding from the fact that they are myths. It is from the book, I Love Paul Revere, Whether He Wrote or Not, by Richard Schenkman. Wrote the book in 1981. He's a professor at the University of Washington, has written a number of books, called one called one Night Stands with American History. And anyway, he's written a number of books. They're fun to read. They've got a lot of little vignettes. Fun to read. But the point of this whole thing is there are a lot of myths that are, are prevalent that we believe and we hold to. And one of those, I believe, is the myth of financial planning. Financial planning, 
the concept was was and is reasonable and logical and it makes sense to have a some sort of plan to move forward the example that's given very often is the pilot that's flying an airplane from Seattle to Hawaii for example and the as the plane cruises along it makes small corrections in the path because of different wind conditions and different weather conditions and different air conditions and the plane you know makes the small corrections ends up a landing in Hawaii and everything is fine that's that's the concept is to have a plan make the small adjustments as you go forward and back in when i formed adams financial concepts i actually spent and bought the very best financial planning program it produced our first report it was like 400 pages long it was detailed it had graphs and charts and <clears throat> projections all through the 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 report they were multicolored they were beautiful it was an incredible report and then i read it and it, as i read it it began to bother me a lot it was not real the assumptions that were made were bad assumptions there's an old saying about computers garbage in garbage out that's what that plan was it was the very best financial planning program and it's very typical of what goes on today the story of what went on with financial planning is back in the mid 80s you had a few people that were doing financial planning a very few people that were doing financial planning but when October 19th 1987 hit and the market dropped 30 percent in one day there was this tremendous fear and trading stopped back in those days most of the revenues that were generated by the large brokerage firms and they dominated the market back then they had over 90 percent of the financial market back then most of what they did was transaction business buy a stock get a commission sell a stock get a commission buy a bond get a commission sell a bond get a commission it was transaction business if you didn't do transactions you didn't make money so it was actually Merrill Lynch that came up with the idea I was at Payne Weber at the time and Payne Weber came up with their idea of doing CDs which they didn't charge the any commission for but there was a backdoor payment to the brokers to sign people up to get them to move money in save money in so that you would have this money and you wouldn't be subject to the stock market falling down what a terrible concept to begin with as I and I digress from that but you know if you've seen your stock portfolio drop 30 percent and then you're going to put your money into a CD and lock in that loss at least for six months or a year or two years whatever it might be instead of <clears throat> coming back with the market as the market returns to what it was before you lock in you stay down below and by the time you get back into the stock market it's a lot higher it's, it would have been like and you can imagine you weren't there very short time ago 2008 when the market went down locking in to a CD locking up something that's a fixed rate of interest locking up something that pays a quarter of a percent locking up maybe for even as long as five years or six years or seven years maybe you're just now coming out of a CD you've missed that triple in the entire stock market that was what Payne Weber did they wanted to put move people into something safe give them a, a feeling of comfort Merrill Lynch took a different approach Merrill Lynch required their financial advisors and they weren't called financial advisors in those days they were called stockbrokers but becoming a stockbroker was a bad bad name after October 19th 1987 so to to make things sound better stockbrokers became financial advisors or financial consultants the Hulk doing the same thing same desk same phone number same address same job but financial advisor instead of instead of stockbroker anyway that's the idea was to get people to focus on their their assets and Merrill came the, with the idea and they required each of their financial advisors each of their stockbrokers to go out and sell at least one plan into the market a plan that would bring in and allow their financial advisors to see all the assets they had 
And the idea was to consolidate their assets, to have a financial plan and move forward. That was the concept. It wasn't in the client's best interest. It was in Merrill's best interest. Merrill wanted to bring the money in so that when people did begin to trade again, they had a lot more money to trade with. And that was, that was the big push into financial planning. That was followed by almost every other firm on Wall Street, the big firms. And suddenly financial planning became a byword. It became a thing. And it sounded reasonable. It sounded logical. Bring all your information. Bring your tax returns. Bring your, your savings accounts. Bring your brokerage accounts. Bring all the information. Put it into a computer. And the computer would spit out what you needed for retirement, what you needed for college savings. It would spit all of that out. And it would calculate it for 7% or 8% return in the stock market and the bond market returns. It did all that for you, and it was a gorgeous-looking report. The problem is, and we saw that in 2008, those plans did not work. A lot of people ended up having to work longer or delay in retirement. We're going to come back to this right after the commercial break, so don't go away. I want to wrap it up and talk to you about what's going on. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Lots of people manage investment portfolios. Just a few can manage a successful portfolio and provide exceedingly great service to their clients. Here's Mike Adams from Adams Financial Concepts. We believe the price you pay should be based on the performance of your portfolio and the quality of service you receive. You know, Mike, it seems that a lot of companies subscribe to the one-size-fits-all mentality of investing. Does one size really fit all? Not with us. Every portfolio that we manage is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. We place our client's interests first in all portfolio decisions. If you're looking for a home for your seven-figure-plus investment portfolio, call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts, specializing in creating and maintaining wealth for over 20 years. 206-903-1019. That's 206-903-1019. Or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So it was very interesting that over the commercial break, we got a, an advertisement about financial planning. Put the plan together and we'll put it, you know, it is a very big deal, and it is something they have schools, and they give diplomas for learning financial planning. You can pay to go to these courses and walk away with a credential. You know, that sounds so reasonable, so logical, so effective. Have a plan of what you're going to do. The fact is it's based on some bad assumptions. One of those bad assumptions is that the market exists on a normal curve distribution. The, not just the stock market, but the bond market and a number of markets. And for me, I got my undergraduate degree in math. And so if mathematically these things worked, it would be wonderful. The normal distribution is that, that bell-shaped curve. You know the one where half of the returns are going to be above the median, half are going to be below, and the mean and the median are the same number, the average is going to be right in the center. And it's the normal curve is such a nice curve to de deal with, that bell-shaped curve, because two-thirds of the, the returns are going to be within one standard deviation. And 95% are going to be within two, and 99% are going to be within three. And it's something very easy to work with. And you, you, you build Monte Carlo simulations based on the normal curve. It's something that 
you can build in, you can say the average return is going to be 7%, and you can say the variability and the standard deviation is going to be X. And all the time, when you look at reports, they give you a standard deviation, which is a number that makes some sense. It's the variation. But the fact is, the market is not does not obey this, a normal distribution. Um, if it obeyed the normal distribution, what we saw from the dot-com should only happen once every 111 years. And what we saw in 2008, 2009, should happen only once in 400 and some years. What We know that the Great Depression happened. We know that 1874, there was a, a crisis. You know, as we look at this, we saw not a dot-com melt when the dot-coms melted down once every 100 years, 111 years. We saw it happen in 2000 to 2002. We saw it in 1990. We saw it in 87. We saw it in 89. We saw it in 1961. We saw it in 29. We saw it in 2008. It happens more than often, and it usually happens more often on the downside than the upside. The downside happens much faster the long, longer term is higher, it's got an upward bias, and it moves with an upward bias. But trying to fit things into a normal distribution into that bell-shaped curve gives false readings. So what's come up lately is to try to jam in and make the normal distribution have fat tails. It's called the fat tail distribution. It's an it's that bell-shaped curve, but with more on the ends, greater greater percentages on the ends. It's still in that whole group of distributions, of the bell-shaped curves, it's called a cow-shaped distribution. It still has that bell-shaped form, just not quite as nice to work with. Instead of being two-thirds within one standard deviation and two-thirds or 95% within two standard deviations, it's got a lot more at the tail ends than it does in the than the regular bell shape normal distribution has but it still doesn't hold it still doesn't hold and what it does is give a false sense of where you're headed with a financial plan not only that by adding asset allocation to the whole thing what you're really doing is reducing your total return when you add stocks at maybe 10%, which they were from 1982 to 2000, when you add bonds at 5%, when you add cash, when you add commodities, when you add all those things together, you get a total return that's less than what you could get if you had a 60-40 portfolio, 60% stock, 40% bonds. And if you have an 80-20 or a 90-10 or even 100% in stocks, you're going to have a much better return than you do when you spread it across asset allocation. That's the issue with financial planning. It's The concept sounds good. It sounds reasonable. It sounds logical. But like so many things that we deal with in the stock market, what sounds logical and reasonable doesn't really hold up. That's... You know, Jack Album wrote a, a book called, he was the chief operating officer of Harris Trust. And he, the book was called Reading Minds and Markets. And he went on to say that if we learned anything from 2008, the most recent experience should not call into question why we invest in the market but rather it should serve as a lesson that investing is not easy. Investment takes hard work, consistency, and objectivity. It's not something you plug into a computer and do. Anyway, that wraps up the part. I've got more to come on other issues, but part of this program is to introduce you, the listener, to what's going on in industry, what's going on in Seattle, what's going on in different areas so that you ha can be ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. My guest today has a very interesting story to tell. I'll let her tell it. So welcome to the program, Cadence. Thanks, Mike. So, Cadence, why don't you give us your background? 
Certainly. My background, I was originally from the Midwest. I live in Seattle now for about seven years, and I went to school for interior design. When I graduated, I was looking for a job that was related to my field, and I happened upon a Craigslist ad for the company that I work at now called Earthwise Salvage. And it was sort of like a match made in heaven. <laughs> so, and I should introduce you correctly. It's okay. <laughs> it's Cadence Englehart of Earthwise. Yes. The retail manager. So, Lindy, retail? I'm the director now. Director. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so, why don't we talk about Earthwise? Sure. Tell us what Earthwise does and what the company is. Earthwise is an architectural salvage company. What we do is we go into buildings or homes that are being remodeled or deconstructed and or demolished, and we reclaim materials that could be reused, and we sell them back to the public. We have two locations in Seattle and Tacoma, and our warehouses are just full of all kinds of wares from local homes and buildings, mostly vintage buildings, though, so it's kind of fun. When you say vintage buildings, mm -hmm. what do you mean? We specialize in the removal of materials from buildings that are from the 50s or before. And why the 50s or, or before? Well, mostly it has to do, Mike, with the fact that the materials for those kind of homes, they were just made at a higher level of quality than what you really see being made these days. Um, it's also about preserving that historic element and removing material from the waste stream. So... <clears throat> Who is buying the materials? Let's talk about who's <laughs> buying, first of all, and then we'll come back to talk about where you get the materials. Sure. Um, you know, it used to be that it was a pretty niche market. We worked primarily with people restoring historic homes and their contractors. But now, really, we're seeing the industry is becoming really popular with shows like American Pickers or Salvage Dogs. And everybody from a lady who lives in the east side or someone who lives in their downtown condo here, trades people, restorers, everybody in the industry, designers, architects, come to Earthwise or other salvage companies for their projects. So what kind of materials are you recovering? You know, if it can be reused and it's in good condition, we do our best to remove it. And I mean, it's everything that you would find in an old home or an old building down to the hardware, the doorknobs that are on every single door in the house, windows, lighting, lumber, uh, goodness, it, it, everything you can think of, flooring, molding. So, so when you say flooring, mm -hmm. what's the advantage of taking flooring that was in a house that dates from the 1920s or the 1940s or the 1900s? Well, one of the biggest benefits is that you're getting material that was really pristine whenever it was actually salvaged or, well, cut down originally, right? So these trees have never been cut down before the forests were old growth. And the grain patterns on that material are exceptionally difficult to match with new material that we grow now simply because we don't let the trees get that old. And so when you're in a house that somebody's restoring, a historic <laughs> house, I would imagine then that the flooring would look much better if it's the old growth rather than the new growth. Oh, absolutely. Um, even once the material was replaced, if they had gone with new growth, it would stand out like a sore thumb because over time, the lumber actually oxidizes and turns a slightly different color. So it would match much better if you get old quality material that's been drying for 100 years. And I imagine it's not just the flooring, it's the window seals and, and other parts of the house too. Absolutely. Even metal products, sometimes they'll stand out like a sore thumb. That patina that you want on brass products, I mean, it doesn't just get there in a week. You have to touch it for 100 years to really <laughs> get that look. <laughs> and I would imagine that there's some windows that, that also come out, too. Absolutely. We get everything from your standard six-pane window, um, single panes, which a lot of people use for craft projects now, to really highly decorative leaded glass, beveled glass, even stained glass windows. Must be quite a process. It is. <laughs> so you go into these homes and take the materials out. We do. We have a crew at both locations. 
Um, usually it's just a two-man crew. They show up after we've done a bid project on your home or building, wherever we are at, and we remove the materials that have been specified as removable, and then we bring them back. It usually takes about a day, sometimes less. Okay, we're going to come right back and find out more about what's going on with Earthwise and the salvage business. So don't go away. Back after the commercial. Stay tuned. About Money returns in a moment with your host, Mike Adams, here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Now we return to About Money. There's more information waiting for you at adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here again is your host, Mike Adams. So I'm here with Cadence Engelhart. We're talking about Earthwise. She's the director of Earthwise. We started talking about them recovering salvage out of homes. So I want to ask the question, if we were to walk into your warehouses, what kind of things would we see? Well, Mike, let me just kind of cast a photo there for you in your mind. You know, when you first walk into the store, it is a salvage yard. We have all kinds of funky stuff outside there, mostly garden materials. But I think my favorite part is when you walk into the Seattle location through the center door, we have this incredible building facade that was salvaged just about three months ago that's actually on the outside of the building with a beautiful pineapple on the top. And once you walk through the door, we have a beautiful cabinet right now that was actually reclaimed from the East Coast, and it ended up here in Seattle, and it was from a cigar shop. Hmm. Very cool. Um, all original. And like, like what size would it oh, be? Oh, um, it's about, I would say, 14 feet by about 10 feet tall, so it's very large. And we also have some beautiful chandeliers right around there. We have two great ones right now that are matching beautiful stained glass with um, like sort of a lantern shape. And it has incredible Eastern or Occidental related motif story on each of the side, five sides. We have door hardware on the wall, like face plates, all different colors. We have an 1890s bar back also in the front area. What is a bar back? The bar back is the part where, you know, they store all of the bar keep materials um, this particular one was a Brunswick catalog order one. And what they would do is that you would pick out specific hardware that you liked, and then they would make five different pieces and then ship that. And Brunswick, yes, as in Brunswick of the pool table lines now, that's actually how they got their start, making uh, bar backs and bar keep materials. Ah, yeah. okay. We also have um, two really cool old tubs right now. I mean, double-ended round um, edges and one is copper and another one is nickel plated copper uh that one came out of an estate in edmonds and really? it's just absolutely incredible i mean it looks like the kind of tub you want to sit in all day long <laughs> and it's got really high sides on it so you can really get shoulder deep in all the water you want so <laughs> you know most of the t old tubs i've seen have been ceramic Kind we do thing. have those too. Yeah, the cast iron cloth foot tubs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have J tubs, which are the ones with a little apron front on them usually. Um, we have doors. We have windows, wooden windows a lot. We also have some beautiful snail glass. That's what I always call them, the snail shape. Um, so it has that little curly Q kind of look to it. Mm -hmm. uh, they came out of a Capitol Hill home that was in someone's stairwell. And those are about 10 feet by 4 feet. Wow. Mm-hmm complete so quite a collection oh yes <laughs> not to mention all of the funky weird things that you find in homes that people leave behind so let's talk about some of the funky weird things that you see <laughs> absolutely one of my favorites is our snowy owl taxidermy piece that we have and the story behind that one is great 
Our, um, one of our former employees, James, he was our salvage manager at the time, was going through a home that didn't have any electricity. <laughs> so he had his headlamp on and he opened a barrel in a closet and lo and behold, these eyes just popped up back at him and he screamed like a little girl. <laughs> and it was actually the snowy owl there in the bottom. So what do you do with a snowy owl? With, I assume the, the owl was not alive. It wasn't. Um, lucky for James. <laughs> but we saved it because we actually can't legally sell it because we can't prove necessarily that it wasn't newer than it is. It's definitely vintage. You can tell by the mount. But... We keep it. We probably wouldn't want to sell it. It adds some ambiance to it. So but. it's a stuffed animal. It's a stuffed It's a animal. stuffed owl, yes. Mm-hmm. Incredible. <laughs> so what other things? We also find interesting things in homes, like old um, vintage stuffed animals is one of them. That Kurt always liked. Kurt Petrowskis is the owner of Earthwise, and it's one of his favorite pieces. It was found in what we call the Roosevelt home, which many people aren't familiar with, but... FDR's daughter actually was married to the post-intelligencer's editor um, at that time when he was a president, and he would that would be his kind of post here when he came out to visit, and they found a little orange leather elephant from around that time, and it's likely from that family. Wow. Mm-hmm. We have interesting other remains. We found some pretty creepy stuff at homes, too. You never know, you know, in the abandoned houses, what you're going to find. And sometimes it could be a little bit gross. But most of the time, you just have to do a little digging and you find some cool stuff. Like, cool stuff. Tell me, <laughs> give us some examples. Another here. one? You want the weird one? You want that yeah. one? Okay. <laughs> so um, about a year ago, around Halloween, we actually had a house come up that was a former doctor's home. And it seems that the gentleman also dabbled a bit in some interesting pieces that he liked to keep in his downstairs workshop area, such as, I mean, lots of bottles with skull and crossbones on them, vintage poison pills, all sorts of things, and not to mention some parts of people (laughs) that he used and kept. Sounds like Mm -hmm. Frankenstein. A little bit like Frankenstein. (laughs) They always seem to come up right around Halloween. (laughs) (laughs) So these things are are for sale if somebody comes down to the warehouse. Absolutely. Mostly it's building materials, but you never know what you're going to find. That's great. (laughs) So I would imagine that for a lot of homes that this is a real positive kind of thing to see vintage materials claimed instead of being burned or otherwise discarded. Absolutely. Um, Most of this material would end up in the landfill, likely, if it were not salvaged or reused. I mean, even things like wood and lumber, I mean, it can be recycled, but it would be better if we could reuse it because of the energy that it would take to recycle it, not to mention to remake something of that quality now. And also, it gives a real character to a house. If somebody is remodeling or building. So how do you work with, with builders then? We actually work with a lot of people who use the salvage materials aesthetically. So you might take what looks like we call the circle saw lumber and wall clad something to really bring the organic feel to a room instead of it just being a white wall. A lot of people make heirloom furniture out of the materials that we sell. Um, Interesting. It's just all kinds of things. So of all the houses that are in Seattle, the old pre-1950 houses, Mm -hmm. how many are we reclaiming? It used to be that with we have, there are three salvage companies active in the Seattle area now. Um, And estimates from King County solid waste were that we were salvaging approximately three to 5% of materials about five years ago. Well, that number's gone up a little bit. We're salvaging about seven to 10% now, but of course we'd love to do more, which is why the DPC action just went through in July of last year. The DPC, what's the Department of Permits, and I can't remember what the C stands for right now. <laughs> okay. But essentially, they issue the demolition permits for anything in the city of Seattle, and what they really want to push is reuse as something that should be 
always thought of from contractors, whether it, that way they can really save their labor costs, not to mention the stuff that could be reused in new construction or even uh, in remodeling. And you pay the con- the builders. For yeah, them we reimburse you. them. Mm-hmm. Not only do we offer free pickups and free removal, we never charge for that unless we're not getting the material. <laughs> um, more than likely, we really reimburse them in some fashion, either in store credit or cash. And we also offer tax donation receipts with our three nonprofit partners, Historic Seattle, Historic Tacoma, and Earth Corps. So with the whole thing, you say <laughs> 7 to 10%. Mm-hmm. What would be the optimum? How much could we, could we if we were 100% efficient, how much would we recycle? Numbers are difficult just depending on who they come from. But what we have really determined, at least here in King County, is that usually between 50 and 70 percent of materials that come from construction sites are recyclable in some way. Now, that could be a little confusing because recyclable and reusable are a little bit different. But it, it estimates are around the 30 to 50 percent mark of what could be actually reused. So we could reuse a lot more than we really are right now. Definitely. With the changes that are going on with the Department of Permits and so on, Mm -hmm. will that make a significant difference? It will make a significant difference. It urges demolition permit um, requests to anything over 750 square feet to have a salvage assessment done prior to the demolition permit issuance. And all we have to do is come to the site. We'll go walk through it with you. You've probably done it six times if you have a building like that. And we'll tell you what is salvageable. And that's all that you need in order to get your permit. It really takes only a, probably an extra 10 minutes. It seems like Seattle's the perfect place for this to happen because we recycle everything. It definitely is. In fact, we were kind of ahead of the industry as it sat nationally. And people do still come here to see what we have going on because most places only have one active salvage company and we have three. (laughs) So do you, and you just reach in the Washington areas, the Seattle, Tacoma. We like to stay as local as possible, about a hundred miles within a a radius of either one of our locations. So tell us where the store is located. Our Seattle location, which is where we've been now for 10 years is at in Soto, which is just North of the West Seattle bridge as it passes over the Soto neighborhood on 4th Avenue South. And our Tacoma location is in a neighborhood just east of McKinley Hill. It is actually East Tacoma. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and you have a website, and on the website, people can get a tour, Yes, they can. They can take store tours of either location on our website. Okay, so you heard about Earthwise. Check their website, and I will be back right after the commercial break. Thanks, Cadence. Thanks, Mike. Lots of people manage investment portfolios. Just a few can manage a successful portfolio and provide exceedingly great service to their clients. Here's Mike Adams from Adams Financial Concepts. We believe the price you pay should be based on the performance of your portfolio and the quality of service you receive. You know, Mike, it seems that a lot of companies subscribe to the one-size-fits-all mentality of investing. Does one size really fit all? Not with us. Every portfolio that we manage is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. We place our client's interests first in all portfolio decisions. If you're looking for a home for your seven-figure-plus investment portfolio, call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts, specializing in creating and maintaining wealth for over 20 years. 206-903-1019. That's 206-903-1019. Or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Seattle.com. We're back with more About Money. For details on what you hear on today's show, visit AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Now, here again is Mike Adams. So we just finished the interview with Cadence Engelhart. And if you would like to log in and see their website, you can either Google Earthwise, which is what I did, or you can go to EWSalvage.com. Check it out. You can take a tour. You can see some of the things that they have there. 
if it's something that you would like to to know about, you can contact Cadence or you can contact somebody at the warehouse. So anyway, please do that. And I wanted to mention the free app you can download. We get feedback from that app. We'll ask a question each week. And this week, the question is, what do you think the minimum wage should be? Um, if you think it should be $35 an hour or $90 an hour or as Dan Price of Gravity Payments, who's been on the program a couple of times, thinks it should be $35 an hour, let us know. Uh, the app is R-E-A-C-H-T. You log in. It's free to download. Download it onto your phone, onto your tablet. And it's about money is the is what you want to sign into, sign up for. It's all free. And you can answer the question, what should the minimum wage be? Well, with that, I want to tell you what my thoughts are about the minimum wage. Washington State has had the highest minimum wage in the country at $10.10 an hour. Actually, last year, $10.10 an hour. It's been the highest wage in the country. And the impact of that, and it's not just, of course, the minimum wage, which is, has affected it. But if you look at 2014, it did not have a negative impact. If you look at 2014, Seattle was the fastest growing city in the nation. Our percentage of growth was leading the nation, number one city. Not only were we the number one city in terms of population growth, we were the number one city in terms of business formation growth. We had more small business startup in 2014, more per capita than any other city in the country. <clears throat> when you look at what's going on with those small businesses, they are the businesses that create the jobs. And not only that, when you have a job, the people that are receiving the funds are making those payments. They're paying for a car. They're paying for clothes. They're going to restaurants. They're doing those sort of things. The butcher pays the baker, pays the candlestick maker is the old, old expression, is that that money comes back and becomes not just a one-fold increase, but by the time the butcher pays the baker, pays the candlestick maker, there's a multiplier effect, and it's three or four times. So as we lift the minimum wage, the people that are receiving that minimum wage will go out and will spend that money, and that will give to the people where they spend it additional funds, which they will spend, and those people that they spend it with will continue to spend it with other people. It is a livable wage kind of focus. People trying to live at $10 an hour is very difficult. And if you look at nationally where we are, the national wage is $7.25. The Economist just published an article. They analyzed where we were and the impact of wages in the U.S. And if it, was, it was a wider spread than just the wages because they looked at what's going on in the U.S. Ex with a stronger dollar, our exports are down 14% for the first quarter, or projected to be down 14% for the first quarter this year. One third of the S&P 500 revenues, if you take the, the companies in the Standard & Poor's 500, one third of their revenues come from overseas, which that's a benefit by having the reduction. But with a stronger dollar, that's impacting what is happening with with our exports, it makes our exports more expensive overseas. And with more expensive exports, our competing products that are manufactured in other countries are cheaper relative to the U.S. So if you look at what's happened, profits for the first quarter were down 1.6% in the, not for the fourth quarter, for the fourth quarter last year. And if you look at the fourth quarter last year, year over year, compare it to the third quarter of compared to the fourth quarter of 2013, you get that profits were down 6.4%. There's a squeeze on profits. It's partly the strong dollar. But the other thing is that it's durable goods. Wages have remained stagnant for a number of years. And with stagnant wages, people can't afford to buy the refrigerators, the dishwashers, the cars. 
And even with the increase we're seeing in many of these products, it's not enough to sustain typical growth. And it's been a surprise to many people because with an unemployment rate, which is approaching 5.5%, it is 5.5%, but it's been dropping down through that, that amount, you would expect that there would be wages that would be increasing. You have normally during a recession, you have wage pressure where you get a reduction in wage amounts. But as you come out of the recession, you end up with wages rising. What we saw, however, is that wages didn't drop as much at the beginning of the recession, and they haven't been rising after the recession. That, I believe, is about the change. 70% of the U.S. GDP depends upon consumers spending money. That means wages have a very significant impact on that. What we're seeing is with 5.5% unemployment, and that's dropped from 10%, we're starting to see talk of wage increases. McDonald's is increasing their wages. Walmart's increasing their wages. You know, I mentioned Dan Price, who's been on the program. He's increasing his employees to 70000 a year. That's unusual. But 70% of companies are now forecasting that they will increase wages by an average of 3% during this next year. They're having to do it because it's harder to find people. During the 2008 time period, 2009 period, we saw that productivity was the real focus, getting lean and mean, producing the same amount of goods with fewer people. That was the focus of what happened in 2008, 2009. But as we've come out of that, if you look at productivity, the productivity gains have slowed down. And now if companies want to increase their sales, they're going to have to employ more people and they're going to have to pay higher wages. Impact of that, if wages increase 10%, it has a negative impact on profits dropping 8%. But it doesn't necessarily mean that wages, that profits will drop that amount. Because if you increase wages, if you increase the number of people that are employed, you get increases in sales as well. Looking back at 1985, 1986, you know, corporate earnings fell 5% from the fourth quarter of 1985 through the March of 86. But the market, although it dropped in the beginning, was up 28% in the next year could be this time going forward. That wraps up today. So be, be back next week. We've got a lot more to cover. And do sign up for the, the free app, R-E-A-C-H-T. Sign up for the app. We'd like to hear your input. And we do give away prizes to the eighth person that signs up, to the 16th, to the 32nd, to the 64th, to the 128th. It's an exponential world we're living in. And next week, I will be talking about exponential growth and companies and the changes that are going on. That's all for today. Have a great weekend, and I'll be back next Friday. listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you want Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared on the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Friday afternoon at 3. For more about money with Mike Adams, here on Money Radio 1300 KKOL. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. 
The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com.